A compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. The Adventures of the Prince's Journey to Semirechye, an incognito from Paris, Semipalatinsk Promenade, His Highness of Jarkent, the mystery of the Royal Photo Archive. Wide boulevards, art galleries and second-hand bookshops on the embankment of the Seine River, famous views of Paris. In 1889, in the high society salons, people only talk about the World Exhibition. Ah, oh, how this new tower destroys the image of the city. And about the scandalous prince. They say he lost his family fortune and he's a constant participant in duels and often finds himself in romantic entanglements with American millionaires. Have you heard that Henry Oliansky's father sent him either to Siberia or to Asia? In general, it can be said that for the French it was some kind of adventure, a desire for discovery. One fine morning, a young aristocrat left Paris in a hurry under a false name. Incognito, he arrived first in Semipalatinsk and then Semirechye, from which, in fact, the story all began. More precisely, the incredible adventures of the French prince. He had problems with local authorities because people very quickly realized that he was a different person. Naturally questions, where he was from, why he was alone and unaccompanied. It was impossible to hide the most important thing, his European and noble origins. It was an entertaining excursion. It is impossible to call it a research expedition. Chapter 1. An Incognito from Paris In general, French travelers were not frequent guests in Semerecha, but some of them visited this place once in a while. For example, the Venensky architect Paul Gourdet was from Paris. The first one who paved the way to these places was a medieval monk, William de Rubruck, and after several centuries, scientific expeditions arrived in the Kazakh landscape. This trip to Asia was regarded as something exotic. There is already China. Even the famous philosopher Mackinder called Asia the gateway to the world. And of course, this could not but attract European travelers, including the French. Previously, people used to joke about these places. From Tashkent to Verney, the road is not right. From Omsk to Verney, it's probably okay. By the end of the 19th century, the route through Omsk, Semipalatinsk and Verny, and then China, became safer. This was the reason for the influx of travelers. A special interest from the British Crown to our region also played its role. Since the 1830s of the 19th century, there has been a special surge in the interests of Great Britain. The so-called big game, a great game, had begun. According to one version, Henry of Orleans had an idea to be the first one from English and Russian travelers through Semirecha to get to Tibet and possibly to India. In addition, a year before the trip, the young aristocrat made a great hunting tour around British India and had full knowledge of the region. He was little more than 20 years old, but the entire Paris had heard of him as a brave duelist and favorite among beautiful ladies. He had Valois and Bourbon blood. His notorious youth and reputation did not prevent him from getting carried away with the benefit of science for geography and becoming a courageous traveler and an interesting writer. From Alexei Bregin, the city on the border. Henry of Orleans, as a representative of the French elite, the political elite, they wanted to bring his contribution to this matter and bring to France some new information. And another assumption, on this journey, there were no political overtones. What is the difference between Henry of Orleans and other travelers? He was primarily a researcher and hunter. For him, personal interest played a big role. He just wanted to see what was there and what kind of animals he could hunt. Chapter 2. 
just combining business with pleasure. The expedition was sponsored by his father, Orleans the Thena. And an indispensable condition for its funding was the inclusion of the prince as a photographer and the head of the scientific caravan, the famous geographer Bonvalo. Money, of course, was needed, but photographers even more so. Henry of Orleans was accompanied by a very experienced man at that time, Bonvalo, because he was visiting Kazakhstan for the third time already. For sure, this experience was taken into account, because the descendant of the Bourbons was to be accompanied by a man who simultaneously had to provide him with security. And so the journey began. Paris, Berlin. In Russia, His Highness came under a pseudonym. Why did he go incognito? Because he wanted to be free. However, the guests were still met by a high authority. Apparently, the person who was incognito was the secret prince. It was the young photographer, and not the leader of the expedition, who was presented with works on the recent trips to China of Przewalski, Pivtsov, and Potanin, then guests from France left Omsk for Semipalatinsk. Chapter 2. Semipalatinsk Promenade. News about the identity of the Parisian incognito also reached Semipalatinsk, and they waited with the travelers for an interpreter was ready, the secretary of the statistical committee who was fluent in French, and an entertaining program in one of the best buildings in the city for living in. The old building in general was executed in the classic style of those years for very rich people. The merchant Stepanov was a very rich man. Not delaying the inspection of housing, the travelers went on a kind of ethnographic excursion. The arrival of the guests coincided with folk festivals in the time of Nauris. Behind the Irtish River, festive yurts gleamed with white koshma. Horses could be heard neighing. The youths laughed on the swings. Everything around smelled of spring. Kisku, Kokpar and Baiga. As a rule, great celebrations were arranged on the Colonel's Island. There was a lot of space and nature, unlike the dull Semipalatinsk. Everything around here pleased the eye. One of the main attractions of Seme, a favorite place for rest, for officers, and an exchange place. There were also commercial shops with exotic goods from China, India, and Central Asia. This was the best place to purchase travel accessories needed for a long journey. An interesting detail was that being in Semipalatinsk, he was looking at the raising of bells of the church of Alexander Nevsky. The building from which he observed this is still preserved, but the church itself is not. Further on, according to the plan, they visited the museum and the library of the statistical committee, and then again went back to the city to fish with the officers. A trip on boats with music, a military orchestra, meetings with local residents, and they brought refreshments back on horseback. They say because of such an impressive welcome, the prince presented the leadership of the battalion with his portrait. Apparently, the topic of the concealment of his highness's personality was not discussed at all. Chapter 3. His Highness of Jacques Kent. The caravan, a little heavier after shopping in Semipalatinsk, arrived in Verney. But the guests did not meet with the expected reception. Officially, the administration, of course, helped with the equipment, but there was enough work to do, so the city was still in ruins. This was a terrible earthquake of 1887 when a lot of buildings were affected. They tried to build something similar to St. Petersburg, but then later everything was destroyed. Most likely, it is on the impressions of the Prince of Orleans and the geographer Bonvalo. A little later, Jules Verne describes this bleak picture in the novel about Claudius Bombarnica. Turkestan has repeatedly been exposed to destructive tremors. Here, the earthquake of 1887 is still remembered. Fortunately, such cataclysms do not happen very often. But weak tremors and soil fluctuations are observed regularly. From the novel by Jules Verne, Claudius Bombarnica.
Whether the members of the expedition managed to meet with their compatriot Paul Gaudet, the famous architect who is rebuilding the city, is not clear. If the meeting did take place, Paul Gaudet would have mentioned it. Henry of Orleans was a person of high status. And the longest rest time. It was from here that the road to Tibet began, the last calm and safe haven of travelers. Imagine a beautiful young Frenchman, a nose with a light bump, a moustache like arrows, a vigorous, bold look like a musketeer. He appeared in the spring of 1889 in Jarkent, accompanied by the geographer Bonvalo, several servants and an interpreter. From Alexei Bragin, the city on the border. He stayed for a certain time in Jarkent, and then was able to describe those places in detail. They were preparing to a long and difficult road. 20 camels, 15 horses were to be equipped, and money was to be exchanged for silver. Buy products and gifts. According to the geographer Bonvalo, this is the main precept of any traveler. A quote, it's necessary to keep an olive branch in one pocket. Instead, we had Turkestan bathrobes, chapan, tea, and sugar. Jarkent is a cozy, warm commercial city, let's say with a certain twist to it. Well, it's no accident, after all, that the city was on the road of the Great Silk Road, and there was a large number of traders who needed something to sell, something to buy, and as profitable as possible. And how to do it right, if not with a certain twist? It's impossible. His Highness did not pay any money for entertainment, but he did not skimp on equipment and became a frequent visitor of local merchant Balia Khan Yodashev. He helped with purchases. They say the merchant brought a guest to the construction site. The future attraction was still being built. The erection of this mosque was the idea of Yodashev. Well, how? He could not boast about it. In Jarkent, they quickly got used to the statue rider with an unusual outfit, in a fur jacket, held by a smart belt in hunting boots and a provocatively flirtatious hat, clad in fancy trimmings. The frivolous descendant of Valois and the Bourbons resembled Tarentins from Tarascon. But the inhabitants of Jarkent had not read Alphonse Daudet and were used to not being surprised at all, for they often saw Buddhist monks and dervishes from Bukhara and Chinese officials from Alexei Bragin's The City on the Border. They hired guards and interpreters, good specialists, half of the future success of the mission of Henry of Orleans thought not to do so without reason. It was impossible to find an Indian languages interpreter and apparently he decided to limit himself to studying Tibet. In Verni, they advised him of a person who knew Mongolian, Chinese, Turkic, and Russian languages. Taransha Abdullah previously served Przewalski. This, according to the prince, was the best recommendation. They signed the contract, and literally a week later, the travelers left for Jarkin. Epilogue, the mystery of the Royal Photo Archive. Kensington, London, the UK, the Royal Geographical Society. His report received a standing ovation. The prince was not at all the same rake and dandy as before. The experienced traveler, who for 17 months had walked 6,000 kilometers under the guidance of the geographer Bonvalo, and a third of the way fell within the territory where he was the first European who set foot in those lands. What motivated Henry of Orleans? It was a desire to discover a new world. And the most important mystery of all, Henry of Orleans published a book with his pictures as a result of the trip, published his own notes with photos of the prince and geographer Bonvalo. But where is the rest of His Highness's photo archives kept? For sure, his photos captured Semipalatinsk and Verny, and certainly Jacquent. Almost half a year's travelers lived in this hospitable tricity. 
But so far, the researchers have found no answers to this mystery.